Welcome back to MMA Al Dente. I am the guy who picked Drew Dober to defeat Matt Frivola. And I'm here to recap UFC 288, just give you my thoughts, what I learned. This will be a relatively short video, even though I have to go through a dozen fucking fights. But let's start at the top. Aljamain Sterling beats Henry Cejudo. This was a fight that was very close. Yes, could have gone either way. In my opinion, Aljo got the better of Cejudo. Uh, you know, just as an overall fight in totality, so to speak. But Cejudo was definitely in the realm of winning a decision, as the judges proved. And to Cejudo's credit, that round five effort was uh, perhaps the most impressive round between either fighter, especially considering Cejudo's layoff and his age and whatever the fuck else. Uh, excellent effort from Cejudo. But in the end, the decision went to Aljo, and it's because of the little efforts early on. You know, Aljo really wasn't there in round five, but even in round one, Cejudo got him down in the second half of that round. Aljo got up and scratch and clawed with that rangy striking and uh, didn't let up, and I thought he took back that round. And that was really the, that's what made this matchup unique, was that these guys were both stellar wrestlers. Aljamain Sterling was the only guy in the realm of out-wrestling Cejudo. And maybe you could argue he did. He, I don't know the stats. I know they each took each other down a few times. And uh, Aljo is the only guy that could take down Cejudo or defend his takedowns. I did think Cejudo probably defended a lot more takedowns from Aljo, really stuffed him down the you know front headlock position. But Aljamain Sterling was still uh, an effective wrestler against the Olympic gold medalist, where nobody else has ever been. Aljo, I did think, would find more success on the ground if he was able to get to one more step into the grappling realm. Actually, make it a grappling battle, but he was never really able to do that. You know, came close. He had one hook in, maybe even two at one point, but he needs that body triangle. He needs to make it a grappling battle. And Henry Cejudo was very sound defensively. And... Uh, you know, he really negated Aljo's primary strength, as Aljo did for Henry, generally speaking. You know, when Henry did get him down, Aljo was right back up. And I think that's what made this mostly a striking battle. And you could argue either guy won. I think Aljo definitely got the better of him. You know, I'm sure the stats prove it. I never really pay attention to stats. I think stats are bullshit. You just, you know, even though if most times the numbers go with the winner, you know, uh... I don't think there's, I don't think that's something you can look to because every punch is different, all that horse shit. I do think Aljo got the better of him on the feet, but Henry was still very much in that round. And these guys were in such close battles that I think those takedowns that didn't really, you know, bring anything. And there was not even like one strike landed for either guy. But those takedowns, uh, Henry in round three, Aljo in round four, at the very end, each guy may have stolen those rounds, respectively. You know, and that's something where people say, yeah, but if you don't do anything, it doesn't fucking count. Sometimes it's the difference maker. You, ha you know, you can't ignore that. Sometimes it's the difference maker. In a close round, you know, I think it was round three, Aljo started getting his head stuffed, you know, put in that front headlock position, had a lot of takedowns defended in between all the strikes. And then in the end, Henry got him down, and I thought... That just made Aljo look bad. At the end, you got to give the nod to somebody for that round. I gave it to Henry. And the same goes for round four. Aljo got Henry down in the final seconds. Actually landed some ground and pound. Uh, although really not much at all in the grand scheme of things. But I thought that was enough for him to win round four. So, very unique matchup. Very close battle. But... History goes with Aljo now. He takes all that history and he is the GOAT bantamweight, whatever the fuck. And for Cejudo, despite coming very close, he does fall short. And, you know, he's a guy that uh, I, I heard him say, he just, he, you know, he's jealous of his teammates or whatever that are spending more time with his kids. He He's chasing greatness, and I don't think we're going to see him. I don't think he's going to be fighting Brandon Moreno or anybody. It's either going to be, you know, Maybe if Sean O'Malley or beats Aljo or something, he'd fight for a title again, which I don't think he'd uh, deserve really on merit, especially with guys like Marab sitting there being denied out of loyalty, or denying themselves, I should say. But Henry Cejudo, uh, 
You know, this was not a shitty way to go out. It's a loss, yes, but much like the Joseph Benavidez loss, you could argue he won it, and he certainly didn't look bad at all in defeat. And Aljamain Sterling, yeah, from here, it's a super fight, really. Not not a super fight, but a big fight with Sean O'Malley, something I'm sure he considers a super fight, just financially speaking. And I hope that fight happens soon. You know, it's, it's going to be a damn exciting one. Sean O'Malley's a guy... That, uh, you know, you can dismiss him all you'd like, but he's a problem. He's a problem for any bantamweight, and that includes the champion. It should definitely be a good one. Although, Aljo's definitely a problem for him as well. Let's face it. Bilal Muhammad uh, beats Gilbert Burns. This was a slow, steady, five-round domination, pretty much. I don't know if you call it domination, but it was uh, five to nothing, in my opinion. So, I guess you can. Bilal beat Gilbert Burns, uh... I thought he took away the wrestling early, was beating him up, switching stances, as the commentators were pointing out, was very effective. Gilbert hurt his shoulder somewhere early and was in throwing his left hand, and he was still in it. Gilbert Burns, he's a fucking warrior, and he can crack, and, you know, he's uh, probably impeccable on the ground, although he can be taken down and neutralized a little bit if you're... Uh, that good with jiu-jitsu and wrestling. But I thought Bilal Muhammad clearly won this fight. It was uh, not mm, not an exciting fight, but still one of his best performances, especially when you consider all the circumstances. I mean, five rounds sprung up uh, on no time, just a few weeks, and Ramadan, all that, and to fight the way he fought, Man, he can't be denied, even with the fans booing and whatever, which I love how Bilal gave it back to him, just said, yeah, Jersey sucks, whatever. You know, that's what you should do if you're in that situation. And, yeah, Bilal Muhammad, there's no denying him now. He gets the next fight after Colby Covington, and uh, you may not be excited for it, but he can't be denied at this point. I mean, he, I thought he couldn't have been denied before this fight, but then to take this fight under all these shitty circumstances... And win 5 nothing over Gilbert Burns under any circumstances, really. The shoulder, whatever else. To win 50-45 over Gilbert Burns, you're the man now. And for Gilbert, he did hurt his shoulder. I'm sure everybody, himself and his team included, are looking to, you know, the uh, two fights he's had in one month. And the three fights he's had already in 2023. And saying, yeah, this was a little bit too much. You know, that's something that, uh, you know, if you weren't going to think of, think that based on the fight itself, based on the shoulder injury, I guess you can think that. He was just not healthy, and it showed. So, tough loss for him. He put it all on the line, and now maybe he's never going to get that title shot again. But, uh, again, that's what happens when you put it all on the line. So, credit to him, fucking warrior. But, yeah, Bilal steps forward. Yan Zhao Nan. Knocked out Jessica Andraj in round one. Uh, Yan Zhao Nan uh, was uh, very effective early on. I mean, I don't know if there was any grappling attempts at all from Andraj, but uh, Yan was definitely leading the dance on the feet. Just a much, much crisper striker. Uh, really effective with those straight punches. And Andraj looked like the limited wild brawler. You know, and Andraj is historically a very tough fighter to get out of there. Again, as I said in the pre-fight interview, she's been finished, but it's against elite fighters or very big, good fighters at bantamweight. And Yan Zhaonan puts herself in that class of very good, smaller fighters who have beaten uh, Jessica Andraj. Erin Blanchfield, Rose Namajunez, Weili Zhang, Valentina, if she counts. She's kind of a tweener, you know, at, straw, at flyweight. But... Uh, Yan Zhaonan looked awesome, got her finest moment here, and yeah, she's uh, a star. You know, Dana's talking about China and whatever, I, you know, her next fight could be for the title, probably should be, although Aaron Blanchfield's uh, ahead of her. Uh, and for Andrade, yeah, this, I think uh, this was a pivotal loss. You know, she's a girl who's always been a contender in many top divisions, and this one, I think, was pivotal. I don't know if she's going to be challenging for a title ever again. She's still relatively young, I believe, 31 years old. But she's got a lot of mileage. This was her 35th fight and now her fifth TKO loss. And this was a very effective TKO loss. This is one that's going to resonate and it's going to linger. So 
just a great moment, a very exciting moment, but shitty for Andrade and a great win for Jan. Really great win. Mofsar Evloev takes out Diego Lopez. Uh, takes him by decision in a fight that was fucking awesome. Diego Lopez, uh, that's the kind of performance where you make a fan of me for life. And that's what happened there. Diego Lopez, and much like the fight he had against Joe Anderson Brito in the Contender Series, he went through every submission at least once. And he had a deep arm bar and a deep knee bar at the very end of that fight, which was so fucking exciting. That was like Frankie Edgar versus Tyson Griffin, UFC 67. Check it out. But, uh... Great knee bar deep at the end of the fight. Fucking just just awesome. Just, just such an awesome fucking fight. And again, much like the awesome fight in the Contender Series, I credit Diego Lopez. He seems kind of limited, sure, especially going in there against a guy like Mozart Evloev. But uh, he's such a slick grappler, and he's got a lot of heart. You know, a lot of heart. I wish I was able to see his uh, TKO losses. I know the last one was a knockout, but... That's what I think. You have to separate this guy from his senses because he's got a lot of heart, and he showed that here. He was up against it in every possible way, taking this fight on short notice against a top 10 fighter. I didn't realize Evloev was a uh, top 10. But, uh, yeah, he he was in this till the very end, despite Evloev looking very sharp and very sound in every which way, aside from the jiu-jitsu realm, really. And Diego made this fight close. So... I mean, look, I've been talking about the fight for a minute here. I've been talking all about Diego Lopez. He was the star of that fight, in my opinion. But Mosar Evloev doesn't get the finish. I thought this was one where he had a potential to get a finish. But he gets another big decision victory, and now he's 7-0 and in the UFC. And he's fucking awesome. You could say whatever you want about it is jiu-jitsu, and he looks more vulnerable now and whatever. He's already been in there with some good grapplers. Nobody's gotten him out of there, and... Nobody's really come close until now. You know, they mentioned Nick Lentz had some success. But Mozar, he's, uh, he's an effective neutralizer. Now 7-0 and in the UFC, seven decisions. Uh, this guy's a problem. So, solid win for him. Charles Jourdain beats Crone Gracie. Jourdain looked awesome. Crone Gracie did not. I'd love to talk about Charles Jourdain, but... The star of this fight is Crone Gracie. He's the story of this fight, anyway. He did not look good. He looked looked limited. You know, he made Braxton Smith look like a comfortable UFC fighter. No, look, I'll say this about Crone Gracie. He's definitely tough. Definitely tough, and I'd say more like he's a real fighter. Just to watch him fight for 30 minutes in a losing effort against Cub Swanson and Charles Jourdain. A uh, guy with whatever he's got, six, seven fights. I really respect that. I really respect that a lot on a lot of different levels. But he's just not a sound, versatile MMA fighter. He's probably going to be a one-trick pony. Again, he's got toughness, athleticism, and some sort of power. Uh, and he, you know, fared well for, you know, he exceeded expectations anyway against Cub Swanson. But here he just looked too limited. Charles Jourdain is a guy that's got that volume that Cub Swanson does not have. And he was really pouring it on from the very beginning. I thought he was wisely just throwing nothing but punches early on and really started hurting Crone Gracie. And after round one, it became apparent to me Crone had nothing. His best chance of winning was a knockout, in my opinion. So Charles Jourdain neutralized a very dangerous but very limited fighter. And uh, he steps forward. Crone Gracie, I don't know where he goes from here, but uh, his ceiling is not championship. His ceiling is beating a really good fighter who's limited and has a gaping hole in his ground game. That's it. Matt Frivola knocked out Drew Dober. This was an awesome fight for Matt Frivola. Now two in a row, he knocked out uh, Atman Azaitar at the Garden, and now still at home, I guess, the Prudential Center, he gets a bigger knockout over Drew Dober in a fight that a lot of people did not predict he would win. Uh, like I said, I bet on him winning by decision because I thought that was really his only path to victory. And Drew Dober, he was knocked out in his one knockout loss before this. A lot of people don't know that. It was, whatever, 12, 13 years ago, 14 years ago. But he was knocked unconscious, and he had been knocked around a lot lately. 
So I guess a TKO seemed a little more possible. Maybe it's something I should have paid more attention to. But Frivola, he just, uh, you know, he, I, he's he gone under the radar, under my radar, especially as a striker. I think he's got some heavy fucking hands. Now got three consecutive TKOs. Valdez, I think he finished on the ground, but he knocked him around, knocked him down four times or whatever. So Matt Frivola looks... Uh, incredible you know drew dober looked even more incredible coming into this fight three consecutive comebacks over solid competition but now matt frivola takes all that momentum and yeah he's uh probably going to be getting a big fight next hopefully patty pimblett like he called for and for drew dober this seemed like an inevitability you know he's a guy that's very tough built a reputation on it had one of the best chins but much like I'll always go back to Noguera, one of my favorite fighters of all time. Noguera, before he ever got finished, he had the reputation for being the toughest fucking guy ever. And he got knocked down in three out of four fights. Josh Barnett, Tim Sylvia, and uh, whoever the fuck else. Heath Herring kicked him in the head. And that was in like 2006 to 2008. And it just seemed like an inevitability. And then he fought Frank Mir and he looked like a zombie. Got knocked down a few times and then finally finished. And after that he had a weaker chin. Started getting knocked out more. And even though Dober already got his first knockout loss out of the way many, many years ago. I feel like this was his chin being cracked wide open for the first time. You know. And uh, you know, after those knockdowns last year and whatever, he seems much more vulnerable. But look, I don't want to make the story about Drew Dober. It's about Matt Frivola. He fucking exceeded my expectations. He kicked a lot of ass. And yeah, he's got a lot of momentum. I hope he fights Patty. Kennedy and Zetrakou chokes out Devin Clark. I don't know if this won fight of the night or not. I wish I uh, looked that shit up. But this, at the time, seemed like it. This was a war uh, for whatever, seven minutes, however long it lasted. Uh, Kennedy was definitely getting the better at Devin Clark. I thought Devin was making it a clinch battle, and I thought that would favor him just because he's you know able to drive somebody with his gigantic legs against the cage and really pressure the shit out of him. But Kennedy beat him up with elbows. Really looked very solid in the clinch. Looked like he had a few takeaways from the Daun Jung fight. But uh, Kennedy was beating him up and hurt him. And then Devin Clark hurt him, cracked him with a big right hand. And I was sure he was going to get the finish. But Kennedy, as he's shown before, uh, he's got a lot of heart. A lot of heart. And I guess you can kind of call this a comeback. Not really. I thought he, you know, it was pretty much domination. But he was hurt very badly at the end of round one. And he kept his composure, fought his way out of that mess, and then ended up taking the round back and almost finishing Devin Clark. So, great first round. It was so exciting. Back and forth. Many potential finishes. And then in round two, Kennedy and Zetriku chokes Devin Clark dead for the guillotine. And it was just a phenomenal victory. His first submission win as a pro. He's got eight TKOs, three decisions, and now one submission. I thought that was a huge feather in his cap. And a great look for the highlight reel. And for Devin Clark, yeah, he looks vulnerable. Always has. But uh, he's a, a game fighter, you know, despite being susceptible to the knockout and the submission. He's a very exciting fighter to watch when he's not fighting another guy who wants to slow things down. Chaos Williams and Rolando Bedoya. This was another excellent debut, much like Diego Lopez. Rolando Bedoya, I'd hate to make it about him because uh, he lost that fight, but... Uh, much like with Diego Lopez, I became a big fan of Rolando Bedoya. You know, he looked very good for many different reasons than Diego Lopez. But uh, in an entire different way, an entirely different way, he made this an awesome fight. And this was a fight that should not have been close. Chaos Williams is a very durable, very powerful guy who's tough to wrangle. And he keeps that power late. And Rolando Bedoya... Like I said in the pre-fight, I really respected his work rate. I thought, you know, he had a chance of winning. It was taking over this fight and out working, out hustling chaos, winning a decision. And, of course, I bet on that. And I think this was a split decision. But either way, it went to Chaos Williams, and that's because Chaos is a battler himself. Very durable and throws visibly harder strikes. And I think that was really the difference maker, at least I'm sure if you ask the judges. 
he threw the harder strikes and he was able to hang in there, not let Rolando's uh, pace and work rate overwhelm him as it has with other fighters. And he kept himself in it, kept himself in the fight and gave himself a shot of winning a decision, which he did. K.S. Williams, big decision uh, victory over a guy, Rolando Bedoya, who I think is going to stick around and probably make a name for himself. So it's a win that'll get better with age. Verna Dan uh, Janda Droba takes out uh, Marina Rodriguez. This was domination pretty much. You know, I thought Rodriguez looked good in the beginning of round three, but it was too little too late, and she lacks the overall danger, the power to, uh, you know, change the fight on a dime like that, really, unless you're vulnerable like Amanda Hebosh. You know, she'd been knocked out twice now. But Verna Dandjadroba had never been finished, and she was tough in this one, very tough when she needed to be, and... She had an athletic advantage and a wrestling and grappling advantage, and I thought she pretty much dominated this fight largely. Great win for Verna. She uh, made Marina look pretty limited, and Marina's a girl who, even though she'd been out grappled before in the UFC, she always pretty much made it work for her, always. You know, even in the Carla Esparza fight, which Carla won that by split decision, but she's a game fighter that's tough to dominate. Verna's the first girl to really dominate her on the ground. So, uh, uh, you know, thoroughly, consistently. Great win for Verna Jandadroba. Parker Porter takes out Braxton Smith. Look, this guy doesn't belong in the UFC. I'm not trying to shit on him. I mean, he took an opportunity. I don't know how it was presented or, you know, how it came about. I know he had a really long layoff for eight years or whatever. And, you know, he uh, had just six fights and a lot of power, you know, for an all first round knockouts, never had a fight go over two and a half minutes. It's just, this seemed like a fight that could go this way, but still to see it happen and unfold like this, I did not expect that. I expected the fight to look somewhat like this, but it lasted another five minutes or so, but he melted pretty quickly. And I don't want to attribute that to an adrenaline dump or whatever, fight jitters or whatever, which it very easily could have been. But it just as easily could have been the body shot that he was hit with, the big knee, which kind of, you know, sucked the life out of him. And that's where Parker Porter got on top of him. But once he was underneath Parker Porter, man, he looked limited. Parker Porter looked like fucking Marcelo Garcia. Not that he, I think he just ended up finishing him from like knee on belly. But Braxton is definitely a limited fighter. He gave it a good go, and this is probably the best possible matchup for him. A guy who's been knocked out, especially recently. He's got a potentially vulnerable chin, much closer to 40 than he is to 30. And uh, Braxton put all of his eggs in one basket and came up short. So I don't think we'll see him again. He's got some work to do. For Parker Porter... He looked like the UFC fighter. How, like, the UFC fighter should look against a limited fighter. Right, Stevie the Cat? Ikrim Alaskarov knocks out Phil Hawes. Look, Phil Hawes is a guy who, again, much like I said about Aljo and Cejudo, he's got that wrestling pedigree where he was, he presented, I thought, a very unique challenge for Alaskarov, where Alaskarov was going to need to be a knockout artist to get this done. And he did. He hit him with a big head kick, which I think DC pointed out, that may have, you know, kind of put Phil Halls up on a T form. And then he hit him with a 1-2 and knocked him dead. So it was a very fine performance from Alice Karov. You know, he hung in there. I'm sure we, he knew he needed to knock Halls out. But before that, Halls was dominating the fight like he does with every other fight. Phil Halls is just the perfect fighter aside from his chin. He's got a weak chin and potentially weak cardio, but he definitely uh, was in the realm of winning this, as he is with any fight. He just has a weak chin, and Alice Karoff found it. So, great debut for Alice Karoff and for Phil Hawes. I don't know if he should fight or not. You know, I'll say this. I think he could beat anybody in the world if all goes right for him and nobody cracks his chin. But his next, if he loses another 10 fights, let's say, at least eight of them are going to be by knockout. Probably fucking ten of them. He's got a weak chin. And that's not going to get any better moving forward. It sucks. It's a physical defect. But it's the reality of the situation. 
And especially because he's such an awesome fighter offensively. He's got such a great skill set where, you know, it's it's taken away a lot. But, you know, it's always going to be there, his chin. So, it is what it is. Zhalga Zhumagulov uh, and Rafael Estevan was pulled, as was Daniel Santos and Johnny Munoz. So I was really looking forward to those. But we opened up the fucking event with Claudio Ribeiro versus Joseph Holmes. My takeaway from this fight was Claudio Ribeiro looked better on the ground than I expected him to. I thought he fared very well on the ground. Stole round one, or, you know, maybe he was on his way to winning it. I forget. But I know he sealed the deal with a big takedown. And then... Even though it took him a while, he advanced to the full mount and landed, like, even if it was five strikes or whatever, it was a gigantic moment for him. He looked like he could have finished that fight with another two seconds, maybe. So, I my estimation of him definitely went up. Of course, he got a big TKO in the second round with a knee, I think. He kneed him and then uh, finished him with subsequent ground and pound. But the grappling was a nice wrinkle for Claudio Ribeiro. And that's where he found success against Joseph Holmes, who I expected to have a grappling advantage here. And Joseph, he was, uh, you know, he, he was in the fight from the beginning. He was thrown down. But you could see when he, he wanted to get the fight to the clinch. And that's where he thought he could take down Claudio. And Claudio ended up winning that clinch battle in the first round and started bullying him around. And that's where I said, fuck, I think I bet on the wrong guy. And Claudio, his uh, knockout rate remains perfect. 11 wins now. He's got 11 knockouts. And, uh, yeah, this was a great, great win for him. Great rebound uh, win after losing to Abdul Razak Al-Hassan. Oh, yeah, so uh, that's it pretty much. Like, share, subscribe, all that horse shit. Check out my other videos. And don't forget to comment below and let me know how fucking stupid I am for all my picks.